thank you. Um, and welcome to the 70th year of the Conference on World Affairs. It's Monday, April the 9th, 2018. The time is 9.30, and this is panel 1002. It's a debate entitled, What Should Be Our Reaction to a Changing Climate? I'm Christopher Sarson, a mediator in Boulder and a moderator for this panel. And right now is the time for you to silence your cell phones, beepers, and other noisemakers, because we need quiet pleas to hear two of the most accomplished and distinguished professors at the conference who are here on stage with me. David Orr, sitting next to me, is the Paul Sayers Distinguished Professor of Environmental Studies and Politics at Oberlin College. I'm not going to read his biography. It's on page 53 of the program, if you've uh, got your program with you. But one of the things that really appealed to me about him was that he's not just an academic, he's a practical, uh, a practical person. Um, 20 years ago, he spearheaded the effort to design, fund, and build a center for environmental studies on the campus of Oberlin College, which in 2010, Architect Magazine called the most important green building in, uh, that had been built in the last 30 years. And the center has received numerous awards. Stephen Hayward, at the end, is currently Senior Resident Scholar at the Institute of Government Cloud Studies at UC Berkeley, and a visiting lecturer at uh, Berkeley Bolt, School, uh, Bolt Law School, Bolt Hall Law School. Um, four days ago, he published The Politically Incorrect Guide to Presidents, where he graded modern-day presidents. Um, Calvin Coolidge got an A+, plus, and uh, an unmentionable, less conservative president got a provisional F. Um, and here at CU Boulder in 2013, he was, apported, he was uh, appointed um, uh, visiting the uh, inaugural visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy. Of his appointment, he commented, this is a bold experiment for the university and me to see whether the ideological spectrum <coughs> can be broadened in a serious way. And right now, we have the perfect subject to demonstrate whether this is possible. Climate change has been one of the most hotly debated topics in the world for the past decade. On the one hand, Al Gore, in his seminal film, The Inconvenient Truth, Sir Richard Attenborough, the BBC naturalist, and many others are pleading for the world to reduce man-made emissions. On the other hand, Lord Moncton and many conservatives are saying that Al Gore's facts and figures are questionable and are distorted, and we shouldn't worry too much. Meanwhile, President Tr Trump intends to withdraw the US from the Paris Accord and says we don't need the EPA. And every night on the news, from Somalia, from the Arctic, we hear that temperatures are rising, ice flows are melting, and we're getting closer to doom and disaster. Well, David has written a book entitled Dangerous Years, Climate Change and the Long Emergency and the Way Forward. And Stephen made a documentary film uh, aimed at the inconvenient truth called An Inconvenient Truth or Convenient Fiction. So what better experts could we have to debate our topic? What should our reaction be to a changing climate. I'll ask each panelist to speak uninterrupted for about 10 minutes, and then we'll spend 10 minutes, they can spend 10 minutes continuing their debate, and there'll be lots of time after that for audience questions, which this year you will send in from your smartphone, or you can raise your hands and one of the producers will come around and give you a card and then bring it up to me and I'll uh, uh, re read your question. Um, David.
2100 is, is really kind of a fake year. 20, the process keeps on going on. So uh, think of that two-degree guardrail. And that was the uh, consensus among climate scientists prior to the Paris Accord. And then they lowered it to 1.5 degrees centigrade. We're now at about 1.2. And the inertial momentum of the system, no matter what we do, what's in the pipeline, will add another uh, we're said roughly half a degree centigrade warming. So we're trending toward a two degree warming. If you read Nature Geoscience about two weeks ago, a uh, long article about the uh, rap more rapid melting of Antarctica. And Antarctica is apparently melting uh, with a doubling rate of every 20 years. And so the same is happening with Greenland and so forth. And so the cryosphere, we underestimated the physics of the cryosphere. The cryosphere, everything frozen on the planet is melting. Uh, now the reaction. Uh, oh, let, let me say this too. 50-50 chance to hold climate change under a two degree warming. Think about the way we consider risk. Uh, that, uh, when, when that award or that number first came out, there, was pe there were people who said, gee, that's way too optimistic. It's uh, much less than that. But think, you wouldn't get into a car. No rational, sane person would get into a car with 50-50 chance of a fatal accident. You wouldn't do it. But we're on a planet that is headed in that direction. So if the risk is merely personal, we're very alert to safety and to precautionary things. You wouldn't get in a car if, the, if you knew the risks of a 
fatal accident were one in 10 or one in 20 or one in probably 50, or whatever the number is. But as a planet now, the scientists, the people again who study climate change for a living and have to live by peer review, fact data, logic, and evidence, put it at 50-50 or worse. Uh, now what do we do? Uh, number one, I think we have to begin to think about politics. While we were busy being right about issues, I mean we in the climate change movement or environmental movement, whatever the movement is, while we were being um, right about the issues and writing great science and holding great conferences in exotic places and writing great books and so forth, they were taking over school boards, city councils, state legislatures, court systems, Congress, now the presidency. So they were doing power, we were doing science. And we thought that in this, the people would be rational. And we know that they're less rational than we thought, uh, at least under the prevailing circumstances. So what do we do? Uh, I think we get the name of the problem right. The cork in the bottle on climate change is politics, the way the political system works. What do we do? Number one, reform money in politics. We have a corrupted system, and no one really can deny that. After Citizens United, uh, the system is woefully corrupt. Uh, Will Rogers once joked that we have the best uh, Congress money can buy, and I think that, that stands even more true now than he thought. Um, gerrymandering. It automatically gives the Republican Party, both parties have done this, but now it's got to be an art form, and Republicans, I don't care what your party affiliation is, but the fact is Republicans got very good at this, and uh, gerrymandering gives the Republican Party virtually across the country roughly a 7% advantage. So it undercuts democracy, one person, one vote. Um, third, end voter suppression. We don't count votes accurately in this country, and there is a major effort uh, underway, has been for years, to suppress votes. And it has crippled uh, election process and the authentic authenticity of elections in Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, uh, all across the country. Um, number four, uh, Tony Seba's talk uh, in uh, 11 o'clock, <clears throat> I think we'll, we'll put out better numbers than I'm gonna offer right now, but. Let's aim for 100% solar power by 2050. We can do it. It's no longer a technological issue. It's not an economic issue. Solar is competitive in virtually every market with baseload coal without all the externalities and extra costs of coal. Let's aim for 100%. We can do that. That is not a technological issue. It is not an economic problem. It's a political issue. The political will has got to be mustered. And the good news is we can do this in lots of ways from the bottom up. Uh, we just finished a, uh, an entirely solar-powered hotel uh, in Oberlin, Ohio, where I live. And Oberlin, Ohio, uh, sunshine is still a theory. <laughs> you all know about sunshine. You see it every day. We have pictures of it. Uh, we read books about it and so forth. Um, and then uh, let's get back into the Paris Accord. Let's get back to the point where the United States actually leads on this issue internationally. Let's get back to where we were and where we should have been 20 or 30 years ago. Remember the first warning from the U.S. President on this issue? It was 1965, and we've been sitting on our hands ever since. So in conclusion, let's understand why we sat on our hands more or less for 53 years at the federal level and in many states. And then let's begin to do what we can do which is considerable. If you can build solar powered, 100% solar powered hotels in Ohio, think of what you can do in Colorado. And think of what can happen in California, in Arizona. Think of what we can do as a nation. We can lead in this, this effort. But let me close by simply saying this is everything. If we sit on our hands for another few years, the scientists, again, the people who study climate for a living and have to live by the rigors of peer review, fact, data, logic, and evidence, the scientists have given a warning. Uh, they've been the Paul Revere's in this, and they've been at this for a long time. The science is now irrefutable. You can quibble at the edges, but you can't deal with the main issue. Put heat trapping gases in the atmosphere, you trap heat. Put a lot of them there, you trap a lot of heat. So this is our, this is our moment. The issue is first and foremost political, but it's also moral and economic. So thank you very much. Stephen, 
Uh, yeah, so um, I'll probably make some opening comments rather than directly engage what Professor Orr said, although the, main, the heart of his point is the one I want to push back on the hardest. I think that the politics uber allis mentality that's been at the heart of this issue from the beginning was a catastrophic mistake. And I'll try and explain it if I can. It, it requires some development. It's hard to do in 10 minutes. So I'm going to make two points. I was a little puzzled by the question of this panel. What should be our reaction to climate change? Uh, David Dates had liked to Johnson in 1954. I like to say that the issue became a top tier issue 30 years ago. And after 30 years, we're asking this question. I mean, I think it's really when James Hansen uh, testified before Congress in those dramatic hearings. And then it became a subject of intense interest in the news media and became on the political agenda. Um, I understand this as a political scientist through a classic article by the political scientist Anthony Downs. He wrote around 1970, he called it the issue attention cycle, and he said most issues go through about five stages. It's sort of the public policy equivalent of the 12 stages of grief, I suppose. And he gave lots of examples in this classic article on civil rights and crime and, you know, the Red Scare, the McCarthy era, and poverty in the 60s, you know, even Vietnam. And he said, this decade is going to see the environment. That's going to be different, and those cycles will be longer. But I won't go through the five steps because it would take too much time, uh, except to say I'll give you um, number five. He says, after a while, we start weighing the trade-offs. We find difficulties. And I'll quote his, uh, uh, the final stage. He says, uh, the final stage, an issue that had been replaced at the center of public concern, sorry, an issue that had been placed at the center of public concern moves into a prolonged limbo a twilight realm of lesser attention or spasmodic recurrences of interest. Uh, and there's a whole lot of poll data. I'm you know, a political scientist. I follow lots of survey data. And so the Pew survey in 2005, 38% of people said climate change should be a top priority. By 2010, it was 28%. Latest Pew survey, 5%. Now, among Democrats, this sort of cross-section. I just saw a recent poll of Democrats asking him what should be the top priority for the next Democratic president. Uh, climate change was named by 6% of Democrats. Uh, number one, by the way, by 50% was fixing health care, which puzzled me. I thought we did that. That's what Obamacare was about, right? I don't, I don't get this. Uh, uh, I, I could go on this a long time. I mean, one analysis I did 10 years ago. By the way, I've actually quit this issue. I now teach American politics and law at Berkeley and have sort of stopped for these reasons down. I think this issue is over as an issue. And, you know, one measure is the New York Times tell you about Fox News, but the New York Times has shrunk its uh, reporters covering environment by half in the last seven, eight years. Uh, I did a nexus search 10 years ago on the instances of tipping point and climate change. Those were, those were uh, you know, favorite terms to deploy as a talking point. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 2001, there were 165 instances of tipping point and climate change. By 2008, 6,000. Uh, and I'll bet if I did that now, you'll find it tapers back down. I did a bar graph of this for a report at one time because um, I was curious about it. Uh, like I say, I can go through a lot of the, the, the political dynamics of this. I, I uh, completely disagree with uh, Professor Orr that it's Fox News and that I can walk you through some stuff. But actually, rather than walk you through some facts and figures, I'll just double down. Uh, if you read the Citizens United opinion and you read Justice Kennedy's majority opinion, Justice Kennedy remembered to swing justice on two key points. After he says we got the previous precedents wrong, there's a parenthesis, and it says C. Hayward, brief, brief for plaint, uh, amicus brief for plaintiffs. So, hi. Um, the second point. Um, first of all, just one quick number. I got curious about the climate targets. The, what eventually emerged was the reduction we need in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 was about 80% from 2005 levels. And, in, and for the United States, that meant going from, in round numbers, about 6 billion tons, a little less, down to about 1.1 billion tons. Well, those are big, my eyes glaze over numbers. What did that mean? I got curious about that. And to make a long story short, I wrote a lot about it 10 years ago, I realized that I asked this question. When was the last time the US emitted 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide from energy use? Turned out the answer was 1910. Uh, so a group of folks at the University of Illinois did their own analysis, and they actually said 1905. So when you play that out, it's extraordinary and pretty radical. And by the way, we have to do this for the whole planet, not just the United States. See, um, and, and I can, you know, as I break that down into personal numbers, well, what it means for all you in Boulder is that all of you have Viking ranges and wolf ranges in your house that run on natural gas. Those are going to have to go. That's for starters. Sorry, but that's just the way it is, because we're going to have to get rid of natural gas at some point. So here's the problem. Um, 
and it made perfect sense at the time. When we decided in 1988 that this was now a, an important global issue, we conceived of this as a large conventional air pollution problem to which we would use the conventional diplomatic and policy solutions we'd used uh, in the past, both for global problems like ozone uh, and nationally the Clean Air Act. Um, and that was a huge mistake. Uh, I could sort of walk through the asymmetries of the Mo Montreal Protocol as a model. I think that's important. Uh, uh, the, the idea that we borrowed from trade treaties, trade was one of our models, by the way, the whole GATT and later WTO was behind the idea of the architecture of the Kyoto Protocol. Strange that people say, let's get back in Paris, and nobody mentions going back to Kyoto. There's a reason for that. Um, and I could go through that for a while. Um, but I think the, you know, what fell out in this country and elsewhere was, all right, uh, let's, um, let's make carbon more expensive, either directly through a carbon tax uh, or through an emissions trading uh, uh, ideas of various kinds. And that made it a huge political problem. Um, it made it a collective action problem. In fact, I call it um, a MOA cap, the mother of all collection action problems, because we're going to have a global carbon tax or a global emissions trading system. Uh, uh, well, I think that uh, I think a better answer is to make low and non-carbon energy cheaper than carbon energy, but you have to do that on a massive scale. So I disagree that you can actually scale up solar to do this. I'm actually bullish on solar. The one question I'd have for David is, is, uh, is that hotel disconnected completely from the grid? If you want to answer that now, you can, but I suspect I know the answer to that question. Um, we, are, we are grid interconnected, so during the day when yeah. sunshine is, ah. you know, when the sun is shining, you draw from the grid. Uh, at nighttime, or you draw from the grid, you're giving back to the grid. At nighttime, you're drawing from the grid. The net result is it generates more power than it uses over the full 365 days. When Elon Musk's battery storage system comes in, yeah. you'll be generating power and storing it on site. And I think that that's actually pretty close. Yeah, so, um, well, I shall we'll do this now. One of the exercises I do when I teach energy policy is to ask students, what are the resource materials and what will be the supply chain carbon footprint of a thousand X battery capacity that we have now? Turns out that's not a 100% substitution, but that's, you know, like I say, we get into the technical aspects of this um, in a big hurry. Um, uh, so here's my main point. If we actually have big scale energy breakthroughs, then we don't need a lot of politics to do it. And by the way, the example is here in this country is with, uh, what's the best, who's reduced greenhouse gas emissions the most in the last 10 years? The United States, without a White House signing ceremony, without politics. So funny little factoid, we tried to pass cap and trade under Obama's first year, the Waxman-Markey bill. It was a terrible bill, it had all kinds, it had $20 billion giveaway for coal. Right, tried that was to buy off the coal people. Uh, but it had interim targets for 2020 that they wanted to reach. We've already reached those goals without the bill passing. Why? It was the natural gas substitution, which of course came from the fracking revolution. If environmentalists had known about fracking, they would have surely done something to stop it in Washington, but it happened before they could get the drop on it. Uh, and of course, you will have to get rid of gas eventually also if you're gonna make these targets. But in the intermediate term, <laughs> it shows that uh, lots of things can change quickly uh, natural gas has put great pressure on both renewables and nuclear power alike. Um, and, but I think the first step of honesty is saying we don't actually know how to do that. It's a massive technological challenge. It's, I think it does no good to use, you know, cliche analogies like an Apollo program that was popular for a while. That's kind of fallen out of fashion. Um, but I think it is correct. I wrote a long report with the from folks at the Brookings Institution seven, eight years ago talking about how little we actually spend on fundamental basic energy materials research, either private or public. The private sector is actually spending more than the government does. The government wants to subsidize all the special interests for, you know, wind and solar and, you know, the, the one research unit in the Department of Energy. Uh, its total budget appropriation under Obama was 385 million bucks a year. The loan guarantee for Solyndra was $550 million. There you go. Um, uh, so I will say, uh, I'll sort of come back to it this way. I think the, the Paris Accord uh, was the climate diplomacy equivalent of the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Remember that one, it was gonna outlaw war. Uh, it actually didn't matter whether we stayed in or, or not. Uh, the latest figures out is that none of the, sig the major signatories, all their emissions are going up the last year. Um, and I, I further think that uh, future policy historians are gonna look back on this whole period from 1988 through Kyoto to now and they're gonna regard the approach we've taken as uh, sort of the equivalent of using, using wage and price controls to fight inflation back in the 70s. 
which no one proposes we go back to. So those are some opening appalling thoughts. Uh, as Mark Twain said, if you don't like those, I have others. <laughs> I saw that uh, David was making lots of notes during uh, that speech, and uh, I know that Stephen was making lots of notes during David's speech, so let them at it, and David, ask one of them, share one of them. Well, let me, uh, I, I don't want to just share one, I want to do something more. I, I think that, let me start with what I think uh, we agree to. And I think that we agree that uh, the situation is, is tough. I mean, I agree when he talks about the understanding the full life cycle uh, effects of battery storage and even solar uh, materials, uh, I, I'm with them. That, that is going to be a tough issue. I tend to be optimistic that that will be solved, whether by an Apollo scale project or by the private market. I think that, that is a solvable issue if we have the will to do it. And if the uh, resources are available to people who do research on these things, I think that's, that's doable. Uh, on the issue attention cycle, uh, uh, I did my PhD work in political science, so I'm familiar with those kind of esoteric articles. Yeah, that's a problem. We are a fickle public, and we do have fads and so forth, and I worry now more and more about the, uh, the effects of television and all of its forms and various screens on our attention. Uh, it's said that we spend, as Americans, nine hours per day on average in front of a screen, one screen or another. And that has its own perils. As we found out, uh, Facebook and the election of 2016, there was a problem there. We hadn't anticipated. As Kevin Roos, writing in the New York Times, said, uh, uh, Zuckerberg created a Frankensteinian monster and had no idea what it was. Well, we discovered some of that, that monster quality in the election of 2016. So th there's an issue of that attention cycle. How long can we stay focused on an issue? Uh, we're really good at war. I mean, we really did a great job in World War II. Uh, we stayed focused, but we had a dependably loathsome adversary, Adolf Hitler. In this case, the problem was rather different. As Pogo uh, once said in Walt Kelly's famous cartoon, you know, we've met the enemy, and he is us. Every one of us in this room, me included, has a carbon footprint. So I agree that we're, we're kind of fickle. Uh, we, this attention cycle is real. Uh, we have a hard time staying focused on things. Third agreement is I think that the market can do things that we underestimated, but only if it's a level playing field. So I would recommend, uh, one more recommendation is to desubsidize all energy sources. Let's quit it. And the globally $5.3 trillion, I'm told, that goes to subsidize fossil fuels globally ends. And then let's see where the, the market takes us. Uh, prices, as uh, Hunter has said, prices that tell the truth about what we do in the world. So imagine that, that standard being applied now to fracking. I'm in Ohio. We see the consequences of fracking. And they are awful. You wreck a good portion of the water supply. You put ingredients in deep in, injected deep into the earth uh, that we don't even know what they are. Uh, thanks to Dick Cheney, uh, we're, per, we're eliminated. We, don't, we can't know what these companies are doing underneath to the water supply. So fracking, which has its own kind of weird economics, a fracked well lasts uh, in Ohio about a year, maybe a year and a half, and then you've got to re-drill and so forth. It's expensive, and most fracking companies, at least those in Ohio, aren't making money. But they're shifting. Our, they, we thought this was a bridge to something. It's not a bridge to anything except uh, more delay. Um, let me uh, also say just a word about Citizens United and, and Fox News. I, I don't want to pick on Fox News. Sure you do. But, <laughs> well, Steve and I are in agreement on a fourth thing now. I do want to pick on Fox News. <laughs> so uh, when we poll people, we make an assumption that their information basis is correct, that they're being given facts. And I think Steve also, I, I agree with Steve on a fifth thing. I think that there is a conservative approach to climate change. And there is a liberal approach to climate. I think you can get there either way. You can be a good conservative, but you have to be a conservative in kind of that Edmund Burkean sense. You cannot be a libertarian and get to climate change. And so th this is a, you can't just say, hey, no government uh, supervision, no rules, no regulations. I mean, it's like showing up at a football game where there are no referees and teams show up with Uzis and hand grenades. <laughs> have a nice day. 
you got to have some rules. And markets work only if there are rules that are agreed upon politically, and they know what those rules are. There are going to be referees, and there are boundaries, and you got to get past that 10-yard line to get a first down. I mean, there are rules. Fancy that. So we assume, as Madison told us a long time ago, that democracy depends on an informed public. That doesn't mean a misinformed public. It's not about the volume of information you get. It's about the accuracy of it. And so uh, j just keep that in mind. A free press determines it not just to be free, but it also is that it is giving you accurate information. And uh, all the media, uh, and here I'm going to widen my critique a little bit because I don't think any of the media have really confronted what's going on in the world. Lane and I are watching the news, the weather news across the country, and climate chaos is here. I mean, it's breaking out with weather all over the, uh, weird weather, all over the country and so forth, but they can't talk about the cause of it. You know, we, we are a scientifically illiterate people. And that, that's why, what is it, 40 or 50 percent of us believe in alien abduction or whatever it is. And uh, Actually, I believe in that because uh, I know some of my family members, you know, that. Uh, <laughs> But, but anyway, but you have to be accurately informed, and it, it doesn't work otherwise. Now, I, I think that there is a case, and I, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to agree with Steve that there is a conservative case, but the word conservative, stop and think about that just a minute. That word means conserving what? Is it just the rules of the game that allow the Koch brothers to get wealthier and wealthier and hide their wealth and offshore a good bit of their wealth that... Uh, those trillions of dollars that disappear from the U.S. economy every year because they're offshored. Read the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. I mean, come on, let's get real here. Our, our economy is kind of a rigged game. But if you are a conservative, then you are going to try to conserve something. This is the word conservation. And this is the word of don't act until you know the consequences. The precautionary principle, which has more play in Europe than it does in the United States, is a conservative kind of thing. So I want to go back to the kind of politics we, we once had. And I agree with Steve. You're not going to solve it all uh, in Washington, and you can make things a lot worse in Washington sometimes. But there's been a 40-year war on government. And that 40-year war has been all about this shift in language from words like I, me, and mine. That's the neoclassical liberal standard. And we've lost the words we, ours, us. This is about where there is a public that can solve its problems publicly. Then if there is that public, let's debate at what scale that public works. Is, is the, the transition of renewable energy and efficiency best done at the local scale with market signals or best done at the federal level or some combination of the two? Can the federal government help in terms of research and development and tax policies and so forth? And oh, by the way, don't get us into stupid wars. You know, as Obama said, you don't do stupid stuff. Leave Kim Jong-un alone. Don't provoke. Uh, because that, that could end the game right there. So uh, I, I agree that there is a conservative case for this, but you have to be a Burkean conservative. And Edmund Burke, uh, if, you, if you remember your political theory, if you don't, how many remember reading in the past several months Reflections on the Revolution in France? Let me see your hands. <laughs> hey, I've got one, I've got two. You know, Burke, Burke described us in the current generation as being trustees. And our function was to pass on an entailed inheritance from the distant past to the far future. And in his world, that was like libraries, museums, culture, religion, rules, and so forth. And if you update Burke to include a stable climate and biological diversity and ecological health, which is part of that entailed inheritance on which all the rest depends, then you get to a conservative view that there are just some things you don't do. You don't do as moral people or as conservatives, and liberals too shouldn't do those things. So th there is a conservative case, and I applaud Steve's work uh, in, in making that case. I will disagree that the uh, uh, Supreme Court made a good decision in Citizens United. That opened up the floodgates, the sewer, to American politics. All of a sudden, money comes in and affects elections in Ohio and Colorado and South Carolina all over that we don't know a thing about but we know it's corrupted, and that's wrong. You cannot run a democracy like that. So I think they're trying to get a democracy that functions where both liberals and conservatives can have this debate, and we can talk to each other. And those aren't, I want to say one more thing. Those aren't opposing viewpoints, because every one of us in this room, and some issues, is conservative. 
Some issues, we're liberal. Nobody is all of one thing or another. We're thinking people are a little bit of both. And as you get older, which I am doing, uh, more rapidly than I would like to happen, but anyway, uh, I get more conservative on some issues. And I think they call it maturity, <laughs> growing up, knowing more. And you see the world differently uh, at age, uh, I'm 74, so you see the world differently at 74 than I did at 24 when I was kind of to the left of Whoopi, I think. Uh, the, uh, the, the issue is those are flip sides of the same coin. They need each other. They're not opposing viewpoints in the sense that they exclude each other. And the last point is, I think that we've entered a really dangerous era in politics where we demonize people. The authoritarian impulse operates on both sides of that spectrum. I think we have to come together. Now the most dependable uh, record of whether parents of kids want their kid to marry a part of the member of the other party is no, you cannot marry a Republican or you can't marry a Democrat. It isn't that they're too short or too stupid or they're Catholic or whatever. It is no, they're Republican or Democrat. That We've got to heal that divide. Uh, democracies have to learn to talk through these issues. So my point is that conservatism and liberalism are not opposing viewpoints. They're flip sides of the same coin. The problem is that some people make a lot of money by dividing us and tribalizing us and as we have to fight back. Thanks. Thank you, David. So, uh, so, so this is starting to get interesting and fun. Um, you know, there's an old saying that, uh, not that old, 20, 30 years ago, that a neoconservative is a liberal with a teenage daughter, <laughs> which is uh, just another way of saying that everyone's conservative about the things they know best. Mm -hmm. and, so, by the way, I, I was my very first lecture I gave the year I came to be an inmate here uh, was, uh, is, co is conservative environmentalist an oxymoron? And I actually start that out with uh, not the reflections on the revolution in France, but Burke's little, little red book called The Vindication of Natural Society, mm -hmm. which is partly an environmental track. I mean, it does not it doesn't use that word, but it's about nature and sort of early part of the romantic tradition. It leads to my uh, central axiom, which is the environment's much too important to be left to environmentalists. They just screw all kinds of things up. And, politicized it. But, uh, so just two points, and, and you know, s but we, we might not be able to sort this out if we're just you and me and King for a day, the usual thought experiment. Um, uh, first, I'm in heated agreement about getting rid of subsidies. I think that figure he was of $5 billion, it, I think it's a bogus figure, but that's maybe tedious to go through that because I, I, I think that'd be the right policy. So why fight about the details? Uh, there's an intermediate case I'll mention too. Uh, which if you or somebody didn't think of it, I'll just sort of make the challenge to myself and say, here's where there is the opening and the necessity of politics. I'm not, a, I'm not an anarcho-libertarian or whatever the word is. Uh, so what I laid out was a, a somewhat abstract and not really extreme, but sort of purist case saying if you have cheaper fuels at large scale than carbon fuels, then you don't need politics. Well, there's an intermediate case, which is probably more realistic, which is what if you get uh, you know, whether it be, I don't know, fusion, which has been 10 years away for the last 50 years, right? Um, or a new generation of nuclear, you know, thorium. Everybody, every time I write about nuclear, I get an email box of people saying, thorium, thorium, and I have no idea if it's any good or not. Uh, but Bill Gates is spending money on it to try and research it, and China's building 20 nuclear reactors. Who knows? Uh, but the problem is, is it might still be more expensive than carbon fuels. You know, gas has gotten very cheap. It'll probably stay cheap, I think. Uh, oil, I think, is, uh, remember something, that in the 70s, in the energy crisis, I'm old enough to remember this, we had, to, we had to move to renewables because we were running out of fossil fuels. Now the case is we need to move to renewables because we're not running out of fossil fuels. That's one of the great things. But the answer's still the same, which make of that what you will. Um, but the point is, is that there's a gap between the uh, sort of market price of some newer technologies and carbon fuels then there is a serious case to say, all right, what about the unpriced damages of carbon fuels under the orthodox way of doing things? That's a controversial subject. The economists argue about that all day long, but it's, the basic principle is sound. That's when you need a diplomatic and political framework to argue, all right, what's the appropriate carbon tax to close that gap and level the playing field? And that's precisely what we do not have going on in our international negotiations. We're still doing crazy, you know, Kyoto National Targets uh, potluck dinner, which is actually, I think, Paris Accords a potluck dinner. What can you bring to the table? Uh, you know, no enforcement mechanism and so forth. And that's still going to be a very naughty political problem. You know, you're going to have to persuade uh, countries like India and China that it's going to be in your interest to have a carbon tax. 
uh, and that's going to be a hard sell. So, and I'll let you, well, I'll let you say how much you like that or not. Um, well, the, the fact that it's a hard thing to do, I mean, I, I'm going to go back to 35,000 feet here just for a second. Uh, the last time I checked, we were 408 parts per million CO2. Haven't been there for a couple of million years, whatever the number is. So we're where we have never been before. And in the, the philosophical literature on this, they call it the transition from the uh, Holocene, the last 10,000 years of that geologic era, to the Anthropocene, which just means basically a human-driven world. And we're, we're where we have never been before. And don't lose sight of the big picture in all the details down here. We have to do something. We have to come together in sufficient numbers around policies. I don't mean a policy, and I think I'm agreeing with Steve on this. There will be a range of things that have to happen. I mean, I've been arguing for years, universities and colleges with a purported obligation to educate their young and not screw up the world they inherit ought to be leading on the issue of carbon neutrality. Uh, we ought to be out in the forefront. We ought to see solar collectors on every university campus. Uh, uh, we've done this in Oberlin, and a lot of other people are doing it too. But we've got a big issue. So that 408 parts per million, never been here before. And it isn't going down anytime soon. Uh, it's going to continue to go up. Uh, on the issue of subsidies, I think he and I would agree, take them away. Let's level the playing field. Let's see where things are, but keep an R and D budget there where you can do the things that investors aren't going to touch, and you can keep research going on some of those things. And so R and D has been really, really good. We got the internet from it, we got a lot of other things from it, but the federal role uh, in research and development has been, uh, I think, by and large, pretty productive. Now, another point of agreement. I think, I think Steve is right that if, if we had a low energy society by whatever means, and lots of local food production, relocalized parts of the economy, we would in fact have less reason for government intrusion in those areas. And I've been writing about that for a long time. I think that goes without saying. You can begin to eliminate a whole parts of government, not right away, uh, and not the way uh, it's occurring now in Washington, but I think you could eliminate a whole lot of regulation by, by getting rid of chemicals in farming and by localizing the farm food supply and by uh, locally owned utilities, solar utilities and by putting solar collectors on your house and business and so forth. I think you can eliminate a lot of that. That's a political theory argument. Uh, I don't want to argue with that. I think it's, there's some plausibility to that. Um, I think the, the issue, however, is how do we get and back to the title of the program, how do we come together as a nation on the largest issue humankind has ever faced? It is the threat that we are posing in this fossil fuel era to the future of life on the planet. That is the proverbial elephant in the room. That can, we can't lose sight of that in the welter of details. I think we'd be in agreement that there are multiple ways to get there. There are lots of different paths and policies, and they have to start at the local level by what people do locally and how we vote and so forth and uh, cascade up to the federal role. And I, I think that there is a way to rethink the federal role, what a federal government does to act as a, an agent that creates uh, activity elsewhere, the role of catalyst to start things and begin to enunciate that uh, the different kind of world and different pathways to get there. So let me stop there. I, I think there, there are things to be done, but again, I come back to this issue of we have to come together as true conservatives and true liberals and independents and all everything else. We have to have a common agenda. And I think the election of 2016 underscored the problem that if you take government and politics casually, then you're going to have hell to pay. And it's going to take us a lot of years to undo the damage that is presently underway in Washington. No matter what happens, uh, we have to keep a public capacity to solve public problems, period. We have two great brains on this uh, stage, and thank you Where both. Are they? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, <clears throat> and one of the lovely things about the Conference on World Affairs is that you, the audience, can uh, um, ask questions. And uh, this is what I have to read before we do that. Before we turn to audience questions and answers, we would like to just quickly mention that CWA is funded in part through generous community support. 
We hope you are enjoying this wonderful event and would consider a small contribution, which is easy through the CWA app. Just click on the Donate tab. So while you're donating on the tab, oh, and also when you, um, uh, ha when you ask questions, be awfully sure if you're a student to put student on because I can't read through the writing to see whether you are and students have priority of questions. So far we have half a dozen questions, none of them from students apparently. So I'll ask some of the questions and you donate on the app and uh, listen to the answers. This is a question for David Orr and it says, can we rely on technology and ignore conservation? Let me uh, preface this by saying that if this was a, my dad was a Presbyterian preacher and there was some that run in the family, and if this was a Presbyterian church service, you'd have an altar call, <laughs> and, uh, or you take up an offering or whatever. Uh, you do it differently here. Um, the, uh, the question about conservation, I think it's, again, to use the same metaphor, it, it's a two-sided coin. And if, if you think of uh, when you bought a refrigerator 20 years ago, it was a device that used 1,750 on average kilowatt hours per year. Uh, state of the art now is uh, around 200, 250. So you go 1,750, 250. Light bulb, incandescent light bulb, you know, 20 years ago, 100 watts, now you get down to four. And so there is a, uh, a revolution in energy efficiency underway. Conservation takes a little bit different tack. Conservation isn't just doing what shouldn't be done more efficiently. So lighting up shopping malls at 4 o'clock in the morning I think is probably not a great idea. Leaving all your lights on all night long or whatever is probably not a great idea. So there are some things that, that, that fall into the conservation basket that say don't do what you shouldn't do. And uh, that, that's, that makes perfect sense. So I don't think technology alone, Wendell Berry, the great uh, writer and farmer in Kentucky, uh, says our problem isn't too little energy, it's too much. And there, there's something, there's some wisdom in that. Uh, what do we use energy for? And we are products of an energy gluttonous society. We all are. I mean, I'm chiefest among the centers. So uh, we have to learn how to use energy from what sources to what purposes. And then keep in mind that, that uh, uh, the decisions that we make have a lot to do with the prospects for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren and the whole human endeavor on the, on the planet. So the answer is uh, I think you need both those. So just a quick comment on that point. Um, by the way, I almost got on The Daily Show once to supposedly defend Dick Cheney's comment that conservation might be a virtue, but it's not really important. Um, a better measure is energy intensity, because uh, that'll capture some aspects of, um, I bet Dave, you probably agree with this. Yeah, uh, what I observe these days is refrigerators are way better, but a lot of people now have two of them. Also, three flat screen TVs and so forth. It's called the rebound effect in uh, energy literature. So conservation it gets you some way down the field. It can't get you to anywhere close to the ambitious emissions targets you've got to get to. And then my favorite one, we all have these things, right? I'm not sure this is still true. Five, six years ago, it was true that these were the, had the energy footprint of a refrigerator, not the thing itself. This is as a tiny battery. It charges in 20 minutes. But think what it plugs into. Every time you do a, a web search, every time you send an email, make a phone call, it's plugged into the digital grid, which oddly enough is not yet broken down on our energy statistics. That's a curious story that I won't bore you with, but it may be as much as 7 8% of our electricity usage is for our wireless devices. So yeah, we made lots of progress, and these are getting better too. Every new generation is there to reduce the, you know, the energy usage of them, and that's all great. Uh, but you can see the problem. Uh, th what David said is where energy, I actually say that human beings might be best known as homo igniferens, right? It, it, uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence in evolutionary biology that all the progress of humanity starts when we mastered fire, however many thousands of years ago. We're energy beings, for better or worse. For better, I think. But. Thank you. A question for Stephen. Do you teach in your classes that leaders should make public policy based on polls? Isn't it a conservative principle that the polluter pays? Uh, do you pay for your use of the global commons? Well, there's several questions there. I don't right. teach in my I, I'm teaching a course this semester at Berkeley on political leadership, political science department. And that's not what I teach. I say as a political scientist, I follow surveys because you want to know what people think. If I could be emperor for a day, I might ban opinion polls. Um, we, I think we'd be better off if we actually had leaders leading instead of saying, ah, I see the people, I must follow them, or, or whatever the people say. Um, 
Uh, but it's, you know, it's good to have these surveys, which have lots of defects. I can go on all day about the defects of public opinion surveys, and often do. Um, so wait, what was the other, that was one. I just wanted to say the premise uh, you, was wrong, but. Um, do you pay for your use of the global commons? Uh, well, does anybody? I mean, I mean, I pay the same taxes as everybody else on, okay. uh, uh, you know, in California, our gasoline's a dollar a gallon more expensive than it is here in Colorado, so I pay more than whoever asked this question, probably. <laughs> okay. Um, can, uh, I am fascinated by this question. Can you please tell us what the ideal average global temperature for human flourishing is? And graciously, it says you may use Celsius or Fahrenheit. <laughs> You're asking somebody from Ohio what the average global temperature ought to be. You know, uh, 72 to 75. Uh, you, you know, we, we flourished uh, in this era called the Holocene. And the temperature brackets, that was an era in which uh, CO2 content in the atmosphere was something you know, in the order of 280 parts per million. It didn't fluctuate a whole lot and hadn't fluctuated for hundreds of thousands of years before. That's simply the ice core record. That's not debated in scientific circles. So um, in, that, in the Holocene, it was like brackets, and it didn't go above or below a certain level. That's when we became everything we've become, for good or bad. That was our literature, our wars, our politics, our highs, our lows, our... You know, everything about humans. That's, that's the era in which we flourished. And it's kind of biblical in a way because it, 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 we've evicted ourselves from that era. And so, uh, like kicking out of the Garden of Eden. And so now we're in this brand new era called uh, the Anthropocene or by whatever name. But now with 408 parts per million, we're way past. If this was an airplane, you would see the gauge go and there would be red lights flashing in that uh, airplane cockpit. And it isn't just that, it's also species extinction, it's nitrogen pollution, it's all those danger zones we've, we've transcended, or in the process of transcending. In case of species extinction, we don't know what the real numbers are, but we know they're big. And so uh, the, the issue for us is how do we begin to get ourselves back, or can we? Bill McKibben's uh, 350.org is an attempt to get our carbon, the carbon level of the atmosphere, back down to 350, which is the outer range, according to Jim Hansen, the great climate scientist, of safety. Uh, my hunch is, or my suspicion is, and I'm not a climate scientist in that way, but my hunch is it's probably lower than 350. It's probably the closer we get back to 280. Uh, Hunter here is leading an effort to figure out how you decarbonize the atmosphere, and that's agriculture and land use. Uh, it's the way we farm and the way we manage forests, these big carbon sinks. Can you pull enough carbon out of the atmosphere quickly and keep it out of the atmosphere? And then you run into some difficulties because in, as we try to do that, the temperatures go up. As you change the rainfall level and the heat level, our capacity to store carbon in soils and in, in biota becomes uh, harder. But that's to answer the question, that was the range in which we flourished as a species. And we went from you know, a few thousands on the plains of Africa to now 7.4 or some such number billion. And we're told we're headed for 10 or 11 billion people. So uh, there is no one number you give. You look at the range of temperatures across the planet throughout the Holocene. There were some hot places that did well. There were some cool places that did well. And there are a lot of places in uh, Northern Europe and parts of the United States who were temperate zones and did real well too. But now we're moving out of that era. And almost every week or every day, we set new records around the earth for hottest hots, wettest wets, driest dries, windiest wind conditions, 52 inches of rainfall in Houston. Think about that. Uh, the largest storm events uh, where uh, the anemometer kicked out at 280 miles per hour. 280 miles per hour. They call it climate chaos or climate weirding or whatever. By whatever words, we're in a brand new era. And we've got to cap that off and begin to retreat back down. Now, one other thing, and I think Steve would agree to this. The, the economy, and I think all the numbers, a lot of them uh, are, there are a lot of numbers, a lot of studies that show this. Actually, that economy, that regenerative, renewably based, hyper-efficient economy is actually a better economy. It's better in terms of profitability, fewer externalities. It's better all the way through whatever metric you want to choose. Now, 
I want to add a kicker on that. My fear is this, and I want you to hear this carefully. My fear is that you could have a hyper-efficient, sustainable, uh, resilient kind of economy that would also be fascist. There is nothing particular about those things that says it's got to be democratic. And so uh, the work I'm doing now on, on democracy, we've got a long project, I don't have time to talk about it, but uh, uh, I'm happy to talk later about it, is I think democracy is worth defending. I think we, the people, are worth defending and our capacity to affect public policy legitimately without interference and without corruption. Uh, I think that you could have a solar-powered fascist society, though. I don't think it would be a thing in the world illogical about that. And the one thing that would stop that is if we in this moment, this historic moment in American history and around the world now, uh, where fascism has become uh, fashionable, we have to begin to preserve that, those hard-won freedoms. There's some are in the Bill of Rights, and there's a positive Bill of Rights that Franklin Roosevelt proposed and so forth. But we have to, we the people, have to act like a people. We have to come together in all our variety of forms because it isn't just about uh, environment. It's about what kind of society we have. Where is justice in that sustainable society? Where is decency? Where are the court systems? Uh, what do we pass on to our children? There are big questions that hang over these choices, and they're not just about technology and temperature. Stephen, any comment? Well, uh, just a brief one. I mean, I have long <coughs> thoughts about this, so I don't want to go on. I want to get more questions. Uh, but this last point is important on a couple of particulars. One is the, the word fascism, I think, has come somewhat indistinct. But to the extent I take your meaning and agree with it, maybe that describes China. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, back up a minute. I think the broader question is um, the sustainability question. And one of the things, uh, here's where I think our sort of general dispositions differ quite sharply uh, is I think we tend to take too static a look at things. Now, I'm not saying that, that that word's misleading. It's not quite the right term because he's talking about large changes in ecosystems as we go forward. Um, but, you know, human beings are the most adaptable species. I actually worry about humans less than everything else because think of where human beings live above the Arctic Circle in the hot desert. Uh, but other species don't live that way. They're much more particular. Um, and, but I actually think a lot of the risks to species are as much from human population growth and habitat transformation that it is from climate. There's an element to it, but if you wave a magic wand and make climate, goes, climate change go away, that problem still exists on a very large scale. Um, but I think it was that, was it William O'Neill? Do you remember that old book of his from 20 years ago about the history of the environment in the 20th century? I forget the title, but he made a very good point. He said, China, you know, that's the Super Bowl right now of all these issues, right? China has been unsustainable. If you take a look at China at any particular moment, how things are going and what the sort of short-term trends are, China's been unsustainable for 3,000 years. And yet they're still with us, and they're going to be with us tomorrow. <laughs> and they've got huge problems, right? And they, they could have some disasters. That's, uh, China's the big story of this century, I think, uh, politically, economically, and in, in every other way. Um, uh, but, but humans adapt to these things because we're a dynamic species. And... I don't want to sound Pollyanna or say, you know, technology will save us or things will come out well. I mean, I actually like a lot of what David says and, and parts of his disposition I admire and like to work with. Uh, but I, 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 one difficulty here is there's, you know, we don't appreciate that the human story is not, you know, sent, you know, sort of momentous decision to change everything. That's the way history books are written. The human story is a day by day, continuously variable, incremental decisions. Just lots and lots of little things happen all the time and make a big difference down the road. Some of them are planned and politically driven, some aren't. Some drive politics, right? It's very hard to put this together in a synthetic way, and I'm not no, sure I'm doing a very good job of it here, but I'll try. This well, I think I want to, I want to speak to that. The, um, I think Steve's just wrong. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, the, uh, I think the humans are adaptable until they're not. Uh, think of Easter Island, uh, and there is a disaster literature that I think we ought to pay attention to. Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, is worth paying attention to. And See, I think there, that book is completely wrong about that, but never mind. <laughs> uh, Sorry, interrupt. No, 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 that, that's quite well, right. Well, that's why uh, this is a debate, for heaven's sake. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he's wrong. I think you'd have to, you, you have to be, go into particularities and so forth, but I, I think he, he's, uh, he's more right than wrong. 
The point is, history is written by the winners, the people who survived. The people who weren't resilient and weren't adaptable, we don't know much about them. Uh, my brother took me uh, last year through the uh, Chaco Canyon era, the Anasazi area of Arizona, and uh, uh, there was cannibalism evident in uh, some of those ruins before the people disappeared. The end of civilizations is never pretty. And so we don't know the story of the people who didn't survive, that were not adaptable. The other point is that now we're a global civilization. And little events, you know, butterfly flapping its wings over Beijing and, you know, storm is breaking out someplace else, thousand miles away. Little things can now interrupt that system. And we become very dependent on a global supply chain. Think of how adaptable New Orleans was uh, with Katrina. Or New York was with Sandy. And then multiply those storms. They can survive because there's still a society intact elsewhere that can ship resources and money and effort to them. But then think if that happens, if it happens on a large enough scale. We had a tornado, uh, there's a special name for it, derecho, I think it is, that was 200 miles wide and basically crossed 2,000 miles of this country a couple years ago. It didn't make the news, except the, the climate modelers noticed it. But big storms broke out in the path of this thing. So as we move into this era of climate chaos, and the weather news this morning, which Elaine and I watched, uh, was just stuff happened everywhere. Uh, that's not how it's going to be. That's how it is now. And you've got this uncomfortable fact that the weather disturbances, the aberrations we now see, those hot, hot, west, west, and dry, dry, and all that, that's a result of the forcing level 20 years ago. That was a result of forcing level around 385 to 390. There's a lag in the system. When the oceans begin, the oceans reach saturation, carbon saturation, then we'll see that 93% of the warming that's gone into the oceans. We only see 7% of that's on land. But when the oceans reach that saturation point, uh, fasten your seatbelt, because then we're going to see rapid climate change. Um, I want to uh, make one other point on this. Uh, China's going to be with us for a while, but I think we are in a new era. China is now, the air pollution in California is uh, heavily influenced by air pollution from China. So now we're in this global era. Their carbon emissions, their sulfur emissions, nitrous emissions, those are now global phenomena. And we live in the United States. We're not nearly as rich as we think we are. We've pushed a bow wave of debt off into the future. That's what the climate change era is all about. We assumed you could uh, fill this sink called the atmosphere with carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases. And you could, it never showed up on your, your balance. So if you had to pay the full cost of carbon, the full cost now of carbon pollution, assuming that you knew what it, what it was or what it is, uh, there are a lot of things we wouldn't do. We have been able to offload a good bit of our costs on future generations or other people. And there is good literature on, on how much we've done. And it's not to our credit. It's to our shame. A good bit of our prosperity rests on having pollution someplace else or at some other time, some other place. And that is, uh, that's not a good thing. And years ago, somebody coined the phrase ghost acres. And they were acres that weren't in your country, but they were acres someplace else you, had, you were allocating the productivity from those acres to your, your society, ghost acres. So uh, th there's a whole uh, new discipline of accounting that we need to develop uh, to get prices that really do tell the truth. And I think Steve and I would be in agreement on, on the use of prices as one, not the only one, but as one of the effective ways to measure what we do and how we do it. And we ought to be insisting on prices that tell the truth. But the difficulty is uh, the world is so complicated now. 100,000 chemicals spewed out there and all kinds of things. And Steve's right in the way he described this. Lots of little things happen else. It's hard to know what we've done in the world, the damage that we do routinely. And so this isn't, there's nothing easy about this. There's no quick fix. There's no uh, magic solution that uh, I or you or anybody else can suggest. But it's going to be a slow withdrawal back to a society that cares enough, that is morally grounded enough to insist that they will pay, that we will pay prices that really do tell the truth. And that's the first and foremost, I put energy at the top of that list. There's a question from a student on the app, which um, I wonder if you can answer. Uh, you've been talking about politics, you've been talking about governmental ways of doing things. What can we do in our daily lives about climate change? Is that to me or 
both, whichever. Excuse me, you want to jump well, on Well, I mean, uh, hmm. I, I, I hate to be grumpy, Gus. The, the, the sort of real <laughs> serious answer is almost nothing. I don't mean that literally. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, um, insulate your house, uh, buy a higher mileage car, all those things count. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, by the way, you know, one of my perceptions is, is that sort of environmental sensitivity, it's a settled middle class value in America now. Um, that's oddly, ironically, why it's not that controversial as a general matter. Um, but all those things don't add to much up on the global scale of the, of the scale of the challenge involved. So, uh, I mean, I get these, uh, by, uh, you, by the way, I used to ask that question, people would say, what can I do to help the environment? I would say, buy a new car. <laughs> and the reason I would say that is because the new generation of cars last to 15 years, that's for conventional air pollution, not yeah. carbon dioxide, but you know, new cars are so much lower in conventional air pollution. So if you, in California, especially where I'm from, you want lower air pollution, buy a new car, get rid of your old clunker. That's probably a gross emitter. Um, and that actually did make a difference in California, the revolution in the car fleet. But that was a different problem than this one. So. David, my, my flip answer was uh, pray, uh, <laughs> drink more. Uh, right. <clears throat> you, you know, um, the best it, way to consume <laughs> ethanol, right? <laughs> uh, I, I think there, there are things to do. Um, uh, I'm a bit of a sports fan, mostly about Cleveland-based uh, teams. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, we're, we're gonna talk about that. You know, I understand pain and suffering more than most of you. Uh, but the advertisements that bring us sports are all about cars. And there, there are always these incredible things that go on, on these roads. There are no other cars on the road. You're going on these wonderful roads, there's scenery around it, and people are so happy, and they got these little buttons to push on their console, it's amazing. But there's never an advertisement for mass transit. Never. Bike trails, walking, get out of your car, walk a bit, you know, meet your neighbors and so forth. Never. And so th this is that transfer from that linguistic change from I, me, mine to we, us, and ours. And the neoliberal model of economics was all about I, me, mine. And change the pronoun. Let's start talking about what we can do together. Uh, now, what do you do in your daily life? Uh, start thinking in those terms. And I, since I, I said this is a political issue, vote. Vote differently. Make sure other people vote differently. Uh, because I don't think there's a transition. I don't think you can make a good case out for whatever the role of government is going to be. I don't think you can make a case out that under its current kind of administration and the current philosophy, and I, don't wanna, I also want to be very clear, I don't think Donald Trump, uh, he, he's a bit of a, an outlier, but I don't think he's an anomaly. I said that in a meeting in New York a few months back, and somebody in the audience yelled out, he's an outright liar. <laughs> but, be, you know, I don't want to get into politics here, and I've gone too far down that. I've offended all of you Trump voters. But anyway, uh, I don't think you can make a good case out. The, the government, under its current philosophy that's been building for decades, get government off our back. And now you thought it was perfectly legitimate to put people in administrative offices with the self-assigned task of destroying those cabinet agencies. And that, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. We need, a, we need a public capacity at the highest level to do some things. And Steve and I, I think, probably would agree with that. But then the question is, what are those some things? We probably would need, want to think that through a bit. And there, there are some, some things that uh, we probably could agree shouldn't happen at the federal level. But I think we need that capacity. And the longer we wait to avoid climate chaos, the more we will need that capacity. The worse it's going to get, the more we're going to need. You know, try calling under when disaster hits here in this, this little liberal bubble of boulder and uh, the mountains are falling down behind you. Try calling 1 800 Walmart. You want to call 1 800 FEMA and you hope somebody answers the phone. And you hope somebody that answers the phone is competent and so forth. We need federal capacity to do some things. And it's not going to go away. And the longer we wait, the more we're going to need it and the more of it we're going to need. So uh, get political. Get political. Understand how we got here. And I don't mean get uh, political only in the, I mean that in the higher sense. Uh, if you think of environment as being something of a, uh, the, the only issue really in politics of defined as who gets what, when, and how, we allocate air, water, resources, timber, fish, oceans, and the future uh, of the ecosphere politically. Those decisions all one way or another are made in that realm called politics. That's government. 
And for too long, we've been busy being right about the issues and all our science and so forth. And I can agree a lot with what Steve said about uh, the fall of the environmental movement. But try running a planet with people who don't give a damn about the environment and don't know anything about it. Try that. And we tried that for a long time. And at some scale of technology and numbers, it just doesn't work. You've got to have ecologically literate people. And you've got to put them in office. You have people who know how the world works as a physical system. And they're not there. If you gave Congress a, a test, just your average test of how the planet works as a physical system, one hour test and it's graded, you, you get below a certain grade, you're out of Congress. I mean, Matt, how many do you think would pass that? <laughs> I don't think many. Try that with federal judges. And I don't think many in the judiciary would pass it. Because law, school, federal, well, law schools don't typically include much about environment. And when they do, they, it's all about environmental law based on the Commerce Clause. Well, the Commerce Clause is a lousy way. If you really want to protect the environment, that's a lousy way to do it. But anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, I didn't take my Ritalin this morning, so I'm off on a <laughs> tangent. Here's another question from a student uh, on the app. What's your stance on population control? China has a program to slow population growth, but the U.S. does not. And it's quite clear that a growing population is a major cause of uh, global warming. Uh, so um, first of all, uh, breaking news, China has abandoned its one-child policy. And they're not yeah, actually encouraging right. people to start having babies again. And that's because a, they're getting old. It's a so two-child policy now, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's because they're actually worried their population is going to start shrinking in another two or three decades. And they're going to get really old, and it's going to be a – it's similar to our Social Security Medicare problem, not enough people to pay in for their social services. Uh, look, I mean, uh, I've actually debated Paul Ehrlich a couple times, and we have fun. I kind of like the guy because I, I debate him differently than most people do and because he's an unreconstructed Malthusian. He's not a neo-Malthusian. He is a Malthusian and proud of it, and that makes for a really fun discussion. And so I've hung out with him a few times. But look, uh, the population bomb was what turned out to be a, something of a wet firecracker. The long-range forecast of the UN Population Agency this has been interesting. I've been following this. I haven't done it lately, but for 15 years, I used to look at the annual report from the UN Population Agency, and they always do three forecasts, a high forecast for out, you know, 50, 70 years, high, medium, low. And today, their highest forecast looking out 70 years is lower than what used to be their low-end forecast 20 years ago. That's how fast global fertility rates have been falling everywhere. And so we're now looking at a, yeah, I mean, I, the, the general thing, by the way, my defense of Ehrlich to conservatives is always he wasn't wrong about the environmental stress population growth would cause. But he said these crazy things about how hundreds of millions of people would starve to death, nothing could be done, all, all the so forth. And the book to recommend on this is that God, the historian at Columbia, Matthew, I forget his last name, called Fatal Misconception, which talked about, you talked about fascism and energy policy. Read about how India tried to impose their family planning which included you know, the army rounding people up and have, having forced sterilizations on women, right? Uh, by the way, we did think about a population policy in this country. You know, the Rockefellers convinced Richard Nixon to have a commission on population growth. Should we have a population policy? And they had a bunch of meetings. Somebody raised their hand one day and said, you know, if we're talking about lowering fertility rates, who has the highest fertility rates in this country? Oh, that's right, it's minorities. That commission was never heard from again. Right? So I think this is one of the old mistakes of environmental, not, not wholly wrong, but uh, the, the problem uh, is not unthinkable. Things could change. We could have breakthroughs in genetic engineering and suddenly we all get to live to be 200. That's going to open a whole new problem for Social Security, <laughs> believe me, if that happens. But there's a lot of that aging research going on. But it's not implausible that 125 years from now, one of the leading social problems of the world is going to be population that's falling too fast. That will be good news for the environment. That's what Edward O. Wilson thinks. In, in the meantime, we've got lots of problems with population, but I think the last thing you want to do is have a politically driven fertility policy. Well, David, the, what can me, you do in 60 seconds? Because uh, that's what we've got left. 60 seconds, and now I'm down to 56. The, the issue is a tough one. Yeah, demographics, and Steve's right, the demographics are, are hard. And, and population, that, that profile of population <coughs> distribution across various ages. Uh, childbearing in uh, less developed countries, childbearing ages are, are the big chunk at the bottom, and it tapers off. There are fewer older people there. Kenneth Boulding once asked how to control population, said, well, let's make a market about it. And so at, uh, at birth, you have the right to procreate so many units of new life. And uh, if you want to raise the population, you, you raise the allowance. If you want to lower, you know, and so forth. Then he was asked, what do you do with cheaters? And his answer was, they're condemned to a year in a daycare center. 
Uh, the, the short answer, you want, you want to deal with population. The only successful way that I've ever heard is you give women rights, uh, reproductive rights, all across the world. So, uh, and, and you do that not, not for population control, but first and foremost as a matter of right. And then population is a derivative. For population levels are kind of derivative. But women's access to education, uh, to investment, to opportunity, to all these things that uh, men tend to take for granted, uh, that is the fastest way to deal with population, and it's also the right way to do it. It is to make this an issue of rights first and foremost. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this conference. A round of applause for these two. Thank you for coming.